Around these parts, we rhapsodize often about Brian De Palma's 1976 adaptation of Stephen King's first novel, Carrie. And we do so with good reason, because, simply put, the movie's a masterpiece. From stem to stern, every inch a masterpiece. It's the unique collaboration between De Palma, who makes everything he touches, no matter what genre he toils in, feel fluid and delirious and gauzy and hazy and romantic and somehow uniquely feminine. And Stephen King, who markets to the middle class, taking everyday abstract stories of people existing in the normal, quote-unquote, world, and twisting them just a little bit, making the situation arcane and changing the characters for better or for worse, sort of like his mentor Richard Matheson used to do. These two artists working in collaboration are certainly the spine of what makes Carrie so great. Then, of course, there's the cast, there's the locations. I mean, everything just works in Carrie. But gelling it all together is, of course, the music. Pino Donaggio, Italian composer and pop musician who kind of fell into composing serendipitously, sort of like his European uh, colleague, Giorgio Moroder, in that with Donaggio, a producer uh, had a vision that he should score Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now which he did to great effect. And De Palma, having seen that film and having loved that film, and in fact, really, if you watch Don't Look Now and look at some of De Palma's work from Carry On In, uh, there is a certain influence. Um, in fact, you can see a lot of De Palma's dream-like uh, obsessions, which are coupled with, uh, of course, his obsession with Hitchcock's Vertigo, um, really come to fruition after Don't Look Now. And maybe that's because of his collaboration with Dinaju, I'm not sure. But either way, the two have made movie magic several times since, Carrie, with films like Dress to Kill, Raising Cain, Brody Double, and most recently, uh, Passions. And I hope there's many more to come. But there's nothing quite like the music in Carrie and the way it works. Not just to uh, give the images heft, but also to kind of sneak and ooze inside the psychology of the characters, chiefly that of poor put-upon Carrie White, who really is just a pawn in the movie and the story, isn't she? I mean, in Stephen King's book, certainly Carrie White is... Uh, Let's say it's a lot homelier than Sissy Spacek was. Uh, Spacek being a, really a beautiful young woman, um, made to look plain. Not ugly, but just plain. But either way, we feel for Carrie White. From frame one, when she suddenly menstruates in the girl's shower in slow motion, and the horror she sees at blood leaking out of her. She's ignorant. She's been used and abused by her mother, who's denied her information about her own femininity to the bullies around her who torment her, to the seemingly benevolent gym teacher, played by Betty Buckley in the film, or Amy Irving's Sue Snell, who seemingly wants to help her as well, get a date for the prom. Everybody who circles Carrie White is using her to make them feel better about themselves. It's a great tragedy. Carrie's the only innocent in the film, the only good person. And you feel that in the music. Again, from those opening strains, which are echoed later when Carrie gets to the prom, when Donaggio uh, evolves them into an actual song, uh, a beautiful haunting ballad. Now, I'm not sure which came first, Donaggio being the pop musician. I don't know if the song came first and then the music was built out of the song. But either way, they are uh, irrevocably linked to each other. Speaking of songs, uh, by the time Carrie gets to the prom and that amazing shot where De Palma's camera circles round and round William Cat and Sissy Spacek, making us feel completely swept up in Carrie's dreamlike rhapsody of being part of the club, part of the clique, part of the cool kids, being accepted. We feel that. We lose ourselves in it, even though we know what's behind the corner. I never dreamed someone like you could love someone like me is one of the loveliest tunes ever recorded. A kind of 70s country-esque ballad that echoes that, uh, the strains of the Carpenters, but is so much more beautiful, sung liltingly by Katie Irving, Amy Irving's sister. Um, there's also the um, string-smacked evil of the music that usually accompanies Piper Laurie, uh, playing Margaret White, Carrie's mother. And God Made Eve, and The Raven Called Sin. These are frightening Bernard Herman-esque tracks that obviously uh, De Palma had said to Donaggio, I want a Herman-esque sound for some of this stuff. And he did it perfectly without losing the essence of what makes Donaggio's music so romantic and beautiful. Then, of course, the unyielding suspense of tracks like Bucket of Blood, when we're getting to the point where that masterfully orchestrated sequence of PJ Souls and... Karen Allen and John Travolta are rigging up the bucket filled with the slaughtered pig's blood to dump on Carrie, which sets off the actual horror of the film. 
every sound in the movie means something. And that's the beauty of this score. This is not incidental horror music. These aren't just useless stings in order to goose an audience. This is not the kind of horror movie that Carrie is. And it's something that's many of the remakes, and we'll call them remakes because even though um, the other versions of Carrie claim to be more uh, closer linked to the uh, original Stephen King text, there's no way you can escape the shadow of Brian De Palma's Carrie. You can't. And each one of those films falls back on many of the tropes that De Palma and Donaggio um, made work so beautifully. But the beauty of this score, again, is the fact that it's not a horror movie score. In fact, it's just a beautiful score, period, about a very damaged, very sad, lonely young girl. If you remove the horror out of Carrie, what you're left with is a genuine, tragic high school drama. The horror is just the stinger at the end. It's the comeuppance. It's the act of God. It gels it all together. It begins in blood. It ends in blood. And it just gooses the tragedy, pushes it into a more fantastic realm. But Danaggio doesn't approach it as a horror film score at all. He approaches it as the music of a girl going down, 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 and taking everyone with her. That's why when the horror does appear, the music means more, the images mean more. There's emotion linked to all of it. Nobody makes movies quite like Carrie anymore. People seemingly have forgotten to use music like De Palma used music. How many of the great filmmakers used music? Sergio Leone, Hitchcock, Scorsese. Not many filmmakers today know what to do with sound. And of course, the hallmark of a great score is whether it lives or dies without the source material. And I'll tell you totally, frankly, Without ever having seen the film, I guarantee you that this soundtrack, Pinot Donaggio's score for Carrie, works splendidly on its own. It's just a great piece of orchestral, haunting, pop-influenced music, where motifs are linked to motifs, where songs end up evolving into themes and melodies that filter throughout the movie. It's an intellectual score as much as it is an emotional score. Yeah. 